Book Two, Chapter Ten of Les Misérables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Garrett Fitzgerald. Les Misérables by Victor Hugo. Book Two, The Fall. Chapter Ten. THE MAN AROUSED As the cathedral clock struck two in the morning, Jean Valjean awoke. What woke him was that his bed was too good. It was nearly twenty years since he had slept in a bed, and, although he had not undressed, the sensation was too novel not to disturb his slumbers. He had slept more than four hours. His fatigue had passed away. He was accustomed not to devote many hours to repose. He opened his eyes and stared into the gloom which surrounded him. Then he closed them again with the intention of going to sleep once more. When many varied sensations have agitated the day, when various matters preoccupy the mind, one falls asleep once, but not a second time. Sleep comes more easily than it returns. This is what happened to Jean Valjean. He could not get to sleep again, and he fell to thinking. He was at one of those moments when the thoughts which one has in one's mind are troubled. There was a sort of dark confusion in his brain. His memories of the olden time and of the immediate present floated there pell-mell and mingled confusedly, losing their proper forms, becoming disproportionately large, then suddenly disappearing, as in a muddy and perturbed pool. Many thoughts occurred to him, but there was one which kept constantly presenting itself afresh, and which drove away all others. We will mention this thought at once. He had observed the six sets of silver forks and spoons, and the ladle which Madame Magloire had placed on the table. Those six sets of silver haunted him. They were there, a few paces distant. Just as he was traversing the adjoining room to reach the one in which he then was, the old servant-woman had been in the act of placing them in a little cupboard near the head of the bed. He had taken careful note of this cupboard. On the right, as you entered from the dining-room, they were solid and old silver. From the ladle one could get at least two hundred francs double what he had earned in nineteen years. It is true that he would have earned more if the administration had not robbed him. His mind wavered for a whole hour in fluctuations, with which there was certainly mingled some struggle. Three o'clock struck. He opened his eyes again, drew himself up abruptly into a sitting posture, stretched out his arm and felt of his knapsack, which he had thrown down on a corner of the alcove. Then he hung his legs over the edge of the bed, and placed his feet on the floor, and thus found himself, almost without knowing it, seated on his bed. He remained for a time thoughtfully in this attitude, which would have been suggestive of something sinister for anyone who had seen him thus in the dark, the only person awake in that house where all was sleeping. All of a sudden he stooped down, removed his shoes, and placed them softly on the mat beside the bed. Then he resumed his thoughtful attitude, and became motionless once more. Throughout this hideous meditation the thoughts which we have above indicated moved incessantly through his brain, entered, withdrew, re-entered, and in a manner oppressed him. And then he thought, also, without knowing why, and with the mechanical persistence of reverie of a convict named Brevet, whom he had known in the galleys, and whose trousers had been upheld by a single suspender of knitted cotton. The checkered pattern of that suspender recurred incessantly to his mind. He remained in this situation, and would have so remained indefinitely, even until daybreak, had not the clock struck one the half or a quarter hour. 
It seemed to him that that stroke said to him, Come on. He rose to his feet, hesitated still another moment, and listened. All was quiet in the house. Then he walked straight ahead with short steps to the window, of which he caught a glimpse. The night was not very dark. There was a full moon, across which coursed large clouds driven by the wind. This created outdoors alternate shadow and gleams of light, eclipses, then bright openings of the clouds, and indoors a sort of twilight. This twilight, sufficient to enable a person to see his way, intermittent on account of the clouds, resembled the sort of livid light which falls through an air hole in a cellar, before which the passer-by come and go. On arriving at the window, Jean Valjean examined it. It had no grating. It opened in the garden, and was fastened, according to the fashion of the country, only by a small pin. He opened it, but as a rush of cold and piercing air penetrated the room abruptly, he closed it again immediately. He scrutinized the garden with that attentive gaze which studies rather than looks. The garden was enclosed by a tolerably low white wall, easy to climb. Far away, at the extremity, he perceived tops of trees spaced at regular intervals, which indicated that the wall separated the garden from an avenue or lane planted with trees. Having taken this survey, he executed a movement like that of a man who has made up his mind, strode to his alcove, grasped his knapsack, opened it, fumbled in it, pulled out of it something which he placed on the bed, put his shoes into one of his pockets, shut the whole thing up again, threw the knapsack on his shoulders, put on his cap, drew the visor down over his eyes, felt for his cudgel, went and placed it in the angle of the window, then returned to the bed, and resolutely seized the object which he had deposited there. It resembled a short bar of iron, pointed like a pike at one end. It would have been difficult to distinguish in that darkness for what employment that bit of iron could have been designed. Perhaps it was a lever, possibly it was a club. In the daytime it would have been possible to recognize it as nothing more than a miner's candlestick. Convicts were, at that period, sometimes employed in quarrying stone from the lofty hills which environed Toulon, and it was not rare for them to have miners' tools at their command. These miners' candlesticks are of massive iron, terminated at the lower extremity by a point, by means of which they are stuck into the rock. He took the candlestick in his right hand, holding his breath and trying to deaden the sound of his tread, he directed his steps to the door of the adjoining room, occupied by the bishop, as we already know. On arriving at this door, he found it ajar. The bishop had not closed it. End of Book Two, Chapter Ten Recording by Garrett Fitzgerald, Brewer, Maine This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Two, Chapter Eleven. What he does. Jean Valjean listened, not a sound. He gave the door a push. He pushed it gently with the tip of his finger, lightly with the furtive and uneasy gentleness of a cat which is desirous of entering. The door yielded to this pressure and made an imperceptible and silent movement which enlarged the opening a little. He waited a moment, then gave the door a second and a bolder push. It continued to yield in silence. The opening was now large enough to allow him to pass, but near the door there stood a little table, 
which formed an embarrassing angle with it and barred the entrance. Jean Valjean recognized the difficulty. It was necessary, at any cost, to enlarge the aperture still further. He decided on his course of action and gave the door a third push, more energetic than the two preceding. This time a badly oiled hinge suddenly emitted amid the silence a hoarse and prolonged cry. Jean Valjean shuddered. The noise of the hinge rang in his ears with something of the piercing and formidable sound of the trumpet of the Day of Judgment. In the fantastic exaggerations of the first moment he almost imagined that the hinge had just become animated and had suddenly assumed a terrible life, and that it was barking like a dog to arouse every one, and warn and to wake those who were asleep. He halted, shuddering, bewildered, and fell back from the tips of his toes upon his heels. He heard the arteries in his temples beating like two forge-hammers, and it seemed to him that his breath issued from his breast with the roar of the wind issuing from a cavern. It seemed impossible to him that the horrible clamor of that irritated hinge should not have disturbed the entire household. Like the shock of an earthquake, the door, pushed by him, had taken the alarm, and had shouted. The old man would rise at once, the two old women would shriek out, people would come to their assistance. In less than a quarter of an hour the town would be in an uproar, and the gendarmerie on hand. For a moment he thought himself lost. He remained where he was, petrified like the statue of salt, not daring to make a movement. Several minutes elapsed. The door had fallen wide open. He ventured to peep into the next room. Nothing had stirred there. He lent an ear. Nothing was moving in the house. The noise made by the rusty hinge had not awakened any one. This first danger was past, but there still reigned a frightful tumult within him. Nevertheless, he did not retreat. Even when he had thought himself lost, he had not drawn back. His only thought now was to finish as soon as possible. He took a step and entered the room. This room was in a state of perfect calm. Here and there vague and confused forms were distinguishable, which in the daylight were papers scattered on a table, open folios, volumes piled upon a stool, an armchair heaped with clothing, a prie-dieu, and which at that hour were only shadowy corners and whitish spots. Jean Valjean advanced with precaution taking care not to knock against the furniture. He could hear at the extremity of the room the even and tranquil breathing of the sleeping bishop. He suddenly came to a halt. He was near the bed. He had arrived there sooner than he had thought for. Nature sometimes mingles her effects and her spectacles with our actions, with somber and intelligent appropriateness as though she desired to make us reflect. For the last half hour a large cloud had covered the heavens. At that moment, when Jean Valjean paused in front of the bed, this cloud parted, as though on purpose, and a ray of light, traversing the long window, suddenly illuminated the bishop's pale face. He was sleeping peacefully. He lay in his bed almost completely dressed, on account of the cold of the Basque Alps. In a garment of brown wool, in which covered his arms to the wrists. His head was thrown back on the pillow, in the careless attitude of repose, his hand adorned with the pastoral ring, and whence had fallen so many good deeds, and so many holy actions, was hanging over the edge of the bed. His whole face was illumined with a vague expression of satisfaction of hope and of felicity. It was more than a smile, and almost a radiance. He bore upon his brow the indescribable reflection of a light which was invisible. The soul of the just contemplates in sleep 
a mysterious heaven. A reflection of that heaven rested on the bishop. It was at the same time a luminous transparency, for that heaven was within him. That heaven was his conscience. At the moment when the ray of moonlight superposed itself, so to speak, upon that inward radiance, the sleeping bishop seemed as in a glory. It remained, however, gentle and veiled in an ineffable half-light. That moon in the sky, that slumbering nature, that garden without a quiver, that house which was so calm, the hour, the moment, the silence, added some solemn and unspeakable quality to the venerable repose of this man, and enveloped in a sort of serene and majestic aureole of white hair. Those closed eyes, that face in which all was hope and all was confidence, that head of an old man and that slumber of an infant. There was something almost divine in this man, who was thus august without being himself aware of it. Jean Valjean was in the shadow, and stood motionless, with his iron candlestick in his hand, frightened by this luminous old man. Never had he beheld anything like this. This confidence terrified him. The moral world has no grander spectacle than this. A troubled and uneasy conscience, which has arrived on the brink of an evil action contemplating the slumber of the just. That slumber, in that isolation, and with a neighbor like himself, had about it something sublime, of which he was vaguely but imperiously conscious. No one could have told what was passing within him, not even himself. In order to attempt to form an idea of it, it is necessary to think of the most violent of things in the presence of the most gentle. Even on his visage it would have been impossible to distinguish anything with certainty. It was a sort of haggard astonishment. He gazed at it, and that was all. But what was his thought? It would have been impossible to divine it. What was evident was that he had been touched and astounded. But what was the nature of this emotion? His eye never quitted the old man. The only thing which was clearly to be inferred from his attitude and his signiomy was a strange indecision. One would have said that he was hesitating between the two abysses, the one in which one loses oneself and that in which one saves oneself. He seemed prepared to crush that skull or kiss that hand. At the expiration of a few minutes his left arm rose slowly towards his brow, and he took off his cap. Then his arm fell back with the same deliberation, and Jean Valjean fell to meditating once more. His cap in his left hand, his club in his right hand, his hair bristling all over his savage head. The bishop continued to sleep in profound peace beneath that terrifying gaze. The gleam of the moon rendered confusedly visible the crucifix over the chimney-piece, which seemed to be extending its arms to both of them, with a benediction for one and pardon for the other. Suddenly Jean Valjean replaced his cap on his brow, then stepped rapidly past the bed without glancing at the bishop, straight to the cupboard, which he saw near the head. He raised his iron candlestick as though to force the lock. The key was there. He opened it. The first thing which presented itself to him was the basket of silverware. He seized it, traversed the chamber with long strides, without taking any precautions, and without troubling himself at the noise, gained the door, re-entered the oratory, opened the window, seized his cudgel, bestrode the window-sill of the ground floor, put the silver into his knapsack, threw away the basket, crossed the garden, leaped over the wall like a tiger, and fled. End of Book 2, Chapter 11 of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Two, Chapter Twelve. The Bishop Works. The next morning at sunrise, Monseigneur Benvenu was strolling in his garden. Madame Magloire ran up to him in utter consternation. "'Monseigneur! Monseigneur!' she exclaimed. "'Does your grace know where the basket of silver is?' "'Yes,' replied the bishop. "'Jesus, the Lord, be praised!' she resumed. "'I did not know what had become of it.' The bishop had just picked up the basket in a flower-bed. He presented it to Madame Magloire. "'Here it is.' "'Well,' said she, "'nothing in it. And the silver?' "'Ah,' returned the bishop, "'so it is the silver which troubles you. I don't know where it is.' "'Great good God! It is stolen! That man who was here last night has stolen it!' In a twinkling, with all the vivacity of an alert old woman, Madame Magloire had rushed to the oratory entered the alcove, and returned to the bishop. The bishop had just bent down, and was sighing, as he examined a plant of coquelaia de Guion, which the basket had broken as it fell across the bed. He rose up at Madame Magloire's cry. "'Monseigneur, the man is gone! The silver has been stolen!' As she uttered this exclamation, her eyes fell upon a corner of the garden, where traces of the wall having been scaled were visible. The coping of the wall had been torn away. "'Stay! Yonder is the way he went! He jumped over into Cochefilet Lane! Ah, the abomination! He has stolen our silver!' The bishop remained silent for a moment. Then he raised his grave eyes, and said gently to Madame Magloire, "'And in the first place was that silver ours?' Madame Magloire was speechless. Another silence ensued. Then the bishop went on. Madame Magloire, I have for a long time detained that silver wrongfully. It belonged to the poor. Who was that man? A poor man, evidently. Alas! Jesus! returned Madame Magloire. It is not for my sake, nor for Mademoiselle's. It makes no difference to us, but it is for the sake of Monseigneur. What is Monseigneur to eat with now? The bishop gazed at her with an air of amazement. Ah, come, are there no such things as pewter forks and spoons? Madame Magloire shrugged her shoulders. Pewter has an odor. Iron forks and spoons, then. Madame Magloire made an expressive grimace. Iron has a taste. Very well, said the bishop. Wooden ones, then. A few moments later, as he was breakfasting at the very table at which Jean Valjean had sat on the previous evening. As he ate his breakfast, Monseigneur Welcome remarked gaily to his sister, who said nothing, and to Madame Magloire, who was grumbling under her breath, that one really does not need either fork or spoon, even of wood, in order to dip a bit of bread in a cup of milk. "'A pretty idea, truly,' said Madame Magloire to herself, as she came and went. "'To take a man in like that, and to lodge him close to oneself, and how fortunate that he did nothing but steal! Ah, mon Dieu, it makes one shudder to think of it!' As the brother and sister were about to rise from the table, there came a knock at the door. "'Come in,' said the bishop. The door opened. A singular and violent group made its appearance on the threshold. Three men were holding a fourth man by the collar. The three men were Jean d'Arme. The other was Jean Valjean. A brigadier of Jean d'Arme, who seemed to be in command of the group, was standing near the door. He entered and advanced to the bishop, making a military salute. Monseigneur, said he, at this word, Jean Valjean, who was dejected and seemed overwhelmed, raised his head 
with an air of stupefaction. Monseigneur, he murmured, so he is not the cure. Silence, said the gendarme, he is the Monseigneur the bishop. In the meantime, Monseigneur Benvenu had advanced as quickly as his great age permitted. Ah, here you are, he exclaimed, looking at Jean Valjean. I am glad to see you. Well, but how is this? I gave you the candlesticks, too, which are of silver like the rest, and for which you can certainly get two hundred francs. Why did you not carry them away with your forks and spoons? Jean Valjean opened his eyes wide, and stared at the venerable bishop with an expression which no human tongue can render any account of. Monseigneur, said the brigadier of gendarmes, so what this man said is true, then? We came across him. He was walking like a man who was running away. We stopped him to look into the matter. He had the silver. And he told you, interposed the bishop with a smile, that it had been given him by a kind old fellow of a priest with whom he had passed the night. I see how the matter stands, and you have brought him back here. It is a mistake. In that case, replied the brigadier, we can let him go? Certainly, replied the bishop. The gendarme released Jean Valjean, who recoiled. Is it true that I am to be released? he said, in an almost inarticulate voice, and as though he were talking in his sleep. Yes, thou art released, dost thou not understand? said one of the gendarmes. "'My friend,' resumed the bishop, "'before you go, here are your candlesticks. Take them.' He stepped to the chimney-piece, took the two silver candlesticks, and brought them to Jean Valjean. The two women looked on without uttering a word, without a gesture, without a look which could disconcert the bishop. Jean Valjean was trembling in every limb. He took the two candlesticks mechanically and with a bewildered air. Now, said the bishop, go in peace. By the way, when you return, my friend, it is not necessary to pass through the garden. You can always enter and depart through the street door. It is never fastened with anything but a latch, either by day or by night. Then returning to the Genda Arms, you may retire, gentlemen. The Genda Arms retired. Jean Valjean was like a man on the point of fainting. The bishop drew near to him, and said in a low voice, Do not forget, never forget, that you have promised to use this money in becoming an honest man. Jean Valjean, who had no recollection of ever having promised anything, remained speechless. The bishop had emphasized the words when he uttered them. He resumed with solemnity. Jean Valjean, my brother, you are no longer belong to evil, but to good. It is your soul that I buy from you. I withdraw it from black thoughts and the spirit of perdition, and I give it to God. End of Book Two, Chapter Twelve of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois. Book Two of Chapter Thirteen of Les Miserables. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by John Bailey. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. Book Two, Chapter Thirteen. Little Gervais. Jean Valjean left the town as though he were fleeing from it. He set out at a very hasty pace through the fields, taking whatever roads and paths presented themselves to him, without perceiving that he was incessantly retracing his steps. He wandered thus the whole morning without having eaten anything and without feeling hungry. 
he was the prey of a throng of novel sensations. He was conscious of a sort of rage. He did not know against whom it was directed. He could not have told whether he was touched or humiliated. There came over him at moments a strange emotion which he resisted and to which he opposed the hardness acquired during the last twenty years of his life. This state of mind fatigued him. He perceived with dismay that the sort of frightful calm which the injustice of his misfortune had conferred upon him was giving way within him. He asked himself what would replace this. At times he would have actually preferred to be in prison with a gendarme, and that things should not have happened in this way. It would have agitated him less. Although the season was tolerably far advanced, there were still a few late flowers in the hedgerows here and there, whose odor as he passed through them in his march recalled to him memories of his childhood. These memories were almost intolerable to him. It was so long since they had recurred to him. Unutterable thoughts assembled within him in this manner all day long. As the sun declined to its setting, casting long shadows athwart the soil from every pebble, Jean Valjean sat down behind a bush upon a large ruddy plain, which was absolutely deserted. There was nothing on the horizon except the Alps, not even the spire of a distant village. Jean Valjean might have been three leagues distant from D. A path which intersected the plains passed a few paces from the bush. In the middle of this meditation, which would have contributed not a little to render his rags terrifying to anyone who might have encountered him, a joyous sound became audible. He turned his head and saw a little Savoyard, about ten years of age, coming up the path and singing, his hurdy-gurdy on his hip and his marmot box on his back. One of those gay and gentle children, who go from land to land, affording a view of their knees through the holes in their trousers. Without stopping his song, the lad halted in his march from time to time and played at knuckle-bones with some coins which he had in his hand, his whole fortune, probably. Among this money there was one forty-sou piece. The child halted beside the bush, without perceiving Jean Valjean, and tossed up his handful of sous, which, up to that time, he had caught with a good deal of adroitness on the back of his hand. This time, the forty sous piece escaped him, and went rolling toward the brushwood until it reached Jean Valjean. Jean Valjean set his foot upon it. In the meantime, the child had looked after his coin and had caught sight of him. He showed no astonishment, but walked straight up to the man. The spot was absolutely solitary. As far as the eye could see, there was not a person on the plain or on the path. The only sound was the tiny, feeble cries of a flock of birds of passage, which was traversing the heavens at an immense height. The child was standing with his back to the sun, which cast threads of gold in his hair, and empurpled with its blood-red gleam the savage face of Jean Valjean. Sir, said the little Savoyard, with that childish confidence which is composed of ignorance and innocence, my money. What is your name? said Jean Valjean. Little Gervais, sir. Go away, said Jean Valjean. Sir, resumed the child, give me back my money. Jean Valjean dropped his head and made no reply. The child began again. My money, sir. Jean Valjean's eyes remained fixed on the earth. My piece of money, cried the child. My white piece, my silver. It seemed as though Jean Valjean did not hear him. The child grasped him by the collar of his blouse and shook him. 
At the same time, he made an effort to displace the big iron-shod shoe which rested on his treasure. I want my piece of money, my piece of forty sous. The child wept. Jean Valjean raised his head. He still remained seated. His eyes were troubled. He gazed out at the child in a sort of amazement. Then he stretched out his hand towards his cudgel and cried in a terrible voice, Who's there? I, sir, replied the child. Little Gervais, I, give me back my forty sous, if you please. Take your foot away, sir, if you please. Then, irritated, though he was so small, and becoming almost menacing, Come now, will you take your foot away? Take your foot away, or we'll see. Ah, it's still you, said Jean Valjean, and rising abruptly to his feet, his foot still resting on the silver piece, he added, Will you take yourself off? The frightened child looked at him, then began to tremble from head to foot, and after a few moments of stupor, he set out, running at his top speed without daring to turn his neck or to utter a cry. Nevertheless, lack of breath forced him to halt after a certain distance, and Jean Valjean heard him sobbing in the midst of his own reverie. At the end of a few moments, the child had disappeared. The sun had set. The shadows were descending around Jean Valjean. He had eaten nothing all day. It is probable that he was feverish. He had remained standing, and he had not changed his attitude after the child's flight. The breath heaved his chest at long and irregular intervals. His gaze, fixed ten or twelve paces in front of him, seemed to be scrutinizing with profound attention the shape of an ancient fragment of blue earthenware which had fallen in the grass. All at once she shivered, he had just begun to feel the chill of evening. He settled his cap more firmly on his brow, sought mechanically to cross and button his blouse, advanced a step, and stopped to pick up his cudgel. At that moment he caught sight of the forty-sous piece, which his foot had half ground into the earth, and which was shining among the pebbles. It was as though he had received a galvanic shock. What is this? He muttered between his teeth. He recoiled three paces, then halted, without being able to detach his gaze from the spot which his foot had trodden but an instant before, as though the thing which lay glittering there in the gloom had been an open eye riveted upon him. At the expiration of a few moments, he darted convulsively toward the silver coin, seized it, and straightened himself up again, and began to gaze afar off over the plain at the same time casting his eyes towards all points of the horizon, as he stood there erect and shivering, like a terrified wild animal which is seeking refuge. He saw nothing. Night was falling. The plain was cold and vague. Great banks of violet haze were rising in the gleam of the twilight. He said, Ah! and set out rapidly in the direction in which the child had disappeared. After about thirty paces he paused, looked about him, and saw nothing. Then he shouted with all his might, Little Gervais! Little Gervais! He paused and waited. There was no reply. The landscape was gloomy and deserted. He was encompassed by space. There was nothing around him but an obscurity in which his gaze was lost, and a silence which engulfed his voice. An icy north wind was blowing, and imparted to things around him a sort of lugubrious life. The bushes shook their thin little arms with incredible fury. One would have said that they were threatening and pursuing someone. He set out on his march again. Then he began to run, and from time to time he halted and shouted in that solitude with a voice which was the most formidable and the most disconsolate 
that it was possible to hear. Little Gave! Little Gave! Assuredly, if the child had heard him, he would have been alarmed and would have taken good care not to show himself. But the child was no doubt already far away. He encountered a priest on horseback. He stepped up to him and said, Monsieur le curé, have you seen a child pass? No, said the priest. One named Little Gervais. I have seen no one. He drew two five-franc pieces from his money bag and handed them to the priest. Monsieur le curé, this is for your poor people. Monsieur le curé, he was a little lad, about ten years old, with a murmur, I think, and a hurdy-gurdy, one of those Savoyards, you know. I have not seen him. Little Gervais, there are no villages here. Can you tell me? If he is like what you say, my friend, he is a little stranger. Such persons pass through these parts. We know nothing of them. Jean Valjean seized two more coins of five francs, each with violence, and gave them to the priest. For your poor, he said. Then he added wildly, Monsieur l'abbé, have me arrested. I am a thief. The priest put spurs to his horse and fled in haste, much alarmed. Jean Valjean set out in a run, in the direction which he had first taken. In this way, he traversed a tolerably long distance, gazing, calling, shouting, but he met no one. Two or three times he ran across the plain, towards something which conveyed to him the effect of a human being reclining or crouching down. It turned out to be nothing but brushwood or rocks, nearly on a level with the earth. At length, at a spot where three paths intersected each other, he stopped. The moon had risen. He sent his gaze into the distance and shouted for the last time, Little Gervé! Little Gervé! Little Gervé! His shout died away in the midst, without even awaking an echo. He murmured yet once more, Little Gervé! But in a feeble and almost inarticulate voice, it was his last effort, but his legs gave way abruptly under him, as though an invisible power had suddenly overwhelmed him with the weight of his evil conscience. He fell, exhausted, on a large stone, his fists clenched in his hair, and his face on his knees, and he cried, I am a wretch! Then his heart burst, and he began to cry. It was the first time that he had wept in nineteen years. When Jean Valjean left the bishop's house, he was, as we have seen, quite thrown out of everything that had been his thought hitherto. He could not yield to the evidence of what was going on within him. He hardened himself against the angelic action and the gentle words of the old man, you have promised me to become an honest man. I buy your soul. I take it away from the spirit of perversity. I give it to the good God. This recurred to his mind unceasingly. To this celestial kindness he opposed pride, which is the fortress of evil within us. He was indistinctly conscious that the pardon of this priest was the greatest assault and the most formidable attack which had moved him yet. That his obduracy was finally settled if he resisted this clemency, that if he yielded he should be obliged to renounce that hatred with which the actions of other men had filled his soul through so many years, and which pleased him. That this time it was necessary to conquer or be conquered and that a struggle, a colossal and final struggle, had been begun between his viciousness and the goodness of that man. In the presence of these lights, he proceeded like a man who is intoxicated. 
as he walked thus with haggard eyes. Did he have a distinct perception of what might result to him from his adventure at D? Did he understand all those mysterious murmurs which warn or importune the spirit at certain moments of life? Did a voice whisper in his ear that he had just passed the solemn hour of his destiny, that there were no longer remaining a middle course for him, that if he were not henceforth the best of men, he would be the worst, that it behooved him now, so to speak, to mount higher than the bishop, or fall lower than the convict, that if he wished to become good, he must become an angel, that if he wished to remain evil, he must become a monster. Here again, some questions must be put, which we have already put to ourselves elsewhere. Did he catch some shadow of all this in his thought, in a confused way? Misfortune certainly, as we have said, does form the education of the intelligence. Nevertheless, it is doubtful whether Jean Valjean was in a condition to disentangle all that we have here indicated. If these ideas occurred to him, he but caught glimpses of, rather than saw them, and they only succeeded in throwing him into an unutterable and almost painful state of emotion. On emerging from that black and deformed thing which is called the galleys, the bishop had hurt his soul, as too vivid a light would have hurt his eyes on emerging from the dark. The future life, the possible life which offered itself to him henceforth, all pure and radiant, filled him with tremors and anxiety. He no longer knew where he really was, like an owl who should suddenly see the sunrise. The convict had been dazzled and blinded, as it were, by virtue. That which was certain, that which he did not doubt, was that he was no longer the same man, that everything about him was changed, that it was no longer in his power to make it as though the bishop had not spoken to him and had not touched him. In this state of mind he had encountered little Gervais, and had robbed him of his forty sous. Why? He certainly could not have explained it. Was this the last effect in the supreme effort, as it were, of the evil thoughts which he had brought away from the galleys, a remnant of impulse, a result of what is called in statics acquired force? It was that, and it was also perhaps even less than that. Let us say it simply. It was not he who stole. It was not the man. It was the beast, who, by habit and instinct, had simply placed his foot upon that money while the intelligence was struggling amid so many novel and hitherto unheard-of thoughts besetting it. When intelligence reawakened and beheld that action of the brute, Jean Valjean recoiled with anguish and uttered a cry of terror. It was because, strange phenomenon, and one which was possible only in the situation in which he found himself, in stealing that money from that child he had done a thing of which he was no longer capable. However that may be, this last evil action had a decisive effect on him. It abruptly traversed that chaos which he bore in his mind and dispersed it, placed on one side the thick obscurity and on the other the light, and acted on his soul. In the state in which it then was, as certain chemical reagents act upon a troubled mixture by precipitating one element and clarifying the other. First of all, even before examining himself and reflecting, all bewildered, like one who seeks to save himself, he tried to find the child in order to return his money to him. Then, when he recognized the fact that this was impossible, he halted in despair. At that moment when he exclaimed, I am a wretch, he had just perceived what he was and he was already separated from himself to such a degree that he seemed to himself to be no longer anything more than a phantom, as if he had, therefore before him, in flesh and blood, the hideous galley convict, Jean Valjean, cudgel in hand, his blouse on his hips, his knapsack, filled with stolen objects on his back, with his resolute and gloomy visage, 
secret, his thoughts filled with abominable projects. Excess of unhappiness had, as we have remarked, made him in some sort of a visionary. This, then, was in the nature of a vision. He actually saw that Jean Valjean, that sinister face, before him. He had almost reached the point of asking himself who that man was, and he was horrified by him. His brain was going through one of those violent and yet perfectly calm moments in which reverie is so profound that it absorbs reality. One no longer beholds the object which one has before one, and one sees, as though apart from oneself, the figures which one has in one's own mind. Thus he contemplated himself, so to speak, face to face, and at the same time, athwart this hallucination, he perceived in a mysterious depth a sort of light which he at first took for a torch. On scrutinizing this light which appeared to his conscience with more attention, he recognized the fact that it possessed a human form, and that this torch was the bishop. His conscience weighed in turn these two men thus placed before it, the bishop and Jean Valjean. Nothing less than the first was required to soften the second. By one of those singular effects, which are peculiar to this sort of ecstasies, in proportion, as his reverie continued, as the bishop grew great and resplendent in his eyes, so did Jean Valjean grow less and vanish. After a certain time, he was no longer anything more than a shade. All at once he disappeared. The bishop alone remained. He filled the whole soul of this wretched man with a magnificent radiance. Jean Valjean wept for a long time. He wept burning tears. He sobbed with more weakness than a woman, with more fright than a child. As he wept, daylight penetrated more and more clearly into his soul. An extraordinary light, a light at once ravishing and terrible. His past life, his first fault, his long expiation, his external brutishness, his internal hardness, his dismissal to liberty, rejoicing in manifold plans of vengeance. What had happened to him at the bishop's? The last thing that he had done, that theft of forty sous from a child, a crime all the more cowardly and all the more monstrous since it had come after the bishop's pardon. All this recurred to his mind and appeared clearly to him, but with a clearness which he had never hitherto witnessed. He examined his life, and it seemed horrible to him. His soul and it seemed frightful to him. In the meantime, a gentle light rested over this life and this soul. It seemed to him that he had beheld Satan by the light of paradise. How many hours did he weep thus? What did he do after he wept? Whither did he go? No one ever knew. The only thing which seems to be authenticated is that that same night the carrier who served Grenoble at that epoch, who arrived at D, about three o'clock in the morning, saw, as he traversed the street in which the bishop's residence was situated, a man in the attitude of prayer, kneeling on that pavement in the shadow, in front of the door of Monseigneur Welcome. End of Book Two, Chapter Thirteen. Book Three, Chapter One of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Three, Chapter One. The Year 1817. 1817 is the year which Louis the Eighteenth, with a certain royal assurance which was not wanting in pride, entitled the twenty-second of his reign. It is the year in which M. Bruguier de Sossum was celebrated. All the hairdressers' shops, hoping for powder and the return of the royal bird, were besmeared with azure and decked with fleur-de-lis. It was the candid time at which Count Lynch sat every Sunday as church-warden in the church-warden's pew of saint germain de prix in his costume of a peer of France with his red ribbon and his long nose, and the majesty of profile peculiar to a man who has performed a brilliant action. The brilliant action performed by M. Lynch was this. Being mayor of Bordeaux on the 12th of March, 1814, he had surrendered the city a little too promptly to M. the Duc d'Angoulême, hence his peerage. In 1817, fashion swallowed up little boys of from four to six years of age in vast caps of morocco leather with ear tabs resembling esquimau mitre the french army was dressed in white after the mode of the austrian the regiments were called legions instead of numbers they bore the names of departments napoleon was at st helena and since england refused him green cloth he was having his old coats turned. In 1817, Pellegrini sang, Mademoiselle Bigottini danced, Potier reigned, Audrey did not yet exist. Madame Saki had succeeded to Forioso. There were still Prussians in France. M. Delalo was a personage. Legitimacy had just asserted itself by cutting off the hand, then the head, of Plénier, of Carbonneau, and of Talleyrand. The Prince de Talleyrand, Grand Chamberlain, and the Aube Louis, appointed Minister of Finance, laughed as they looked at each other, with the laugh of the two augurs, both whom had celebrated on the 14th of July, 1790, the mass of federation in the Champ de Mars. Talleyrand said it as bishop. Louis had served it in the capacity of deacon. In 1817, in the side alleys of this same Champ de Mars, two great cylinders of wood might have been seen lying in the rain, rotting amid the grass, painted blue, with traces of eagles and bees, from which the gilding was falling. These were the columns which two years before had upheld the Emperor's platform in the Champ de May. They were blackened here and there with the scorches of the bivouac of Austrians encamped near Gros Caillou. Two or three of these columns had disappeared in these bivouac fires and had warmed the large hands of the Imperial troops. The field of May had this remarkable point that it had been held in the month of June, and in the field of March, Mars. In this year, 1817, two things were popular, the Volder Toquet and the snuff-box à la Chatea. The most recent Parisian sensation was the crime of Dautun, who had thrown his brother's head into the fountain of the flower-market. They had begun to feel anxious at the naval department, on account of the lack of news from that fatal frigate, the Medusa, which was destined to cover Chalmeret with infamy and Garicault with glory. Colonel Selves was going to Egypt to become Solomon Pasha. The palace of Thermes, in the Rue de la Harpe, served as a shop for a cooper. On the platform of the octagonal tower of the Hotel de Cluny, the little shed of boards which had served as an observatory to Monsieur, the naval astronomer under Louis the Fourteenth, 
was still to be seen. The Duchess de Duras read to three or four friends her unpublished Origa, in her boudoir furnished by ten in sky-blue satin. The ends were scratched off the Louvre. The bridge of Austerlitz had abdicated, and was entitled the bridge of the King's Garden, du Jardin du Roi, a double enigma, which disguised the bridge of Austerlitz and the Jardin de Plantes at one stroke. Louis the Eighteenth, much preoccupied while annotating Horace with the corner of his fingernail, heroes who have become emperors, and makers of wooden shoes who have become dauphins, had two anxieties, Napoleon and Mathurin Brunau. The French Academy had given for its prize subject the happiness procured through study. M. Bella was officially eloquent. In his shadow could be seen germinating that future advocate general of Bras, dedicated to the sarcasms of Paul Louis Courier. There was a false Chateaubriand named Marchangy in the interim until there should be a false Marchangy named d'Alencourt. Claire de Albe and Malik Adel were masterpieces. Madame Coutin was proclaimed the chief writer of the epoch. The Institute had the academician, Napoleon Bonaparte, stricken from its list of members. A royal ordinance erected Angoulême into a naval school. For the Duc d'Angoulême, being a Lord High Admiral, it was evident that the city of Angoulême had all the qualities of a seaport. Otherwise the monarchical principle would have received a wound. In the Council of Ministers the question was agitated whether vignettes representing slack-rope performances which adorned Franconi's advertising posters and which attracted throngs of street urchins should be tolerated. M. Pere, the author of Agnes, a good sort of fellow, with a square face and a wart on his cheek, directed the little private concerts of the Marquis de Sassenay in the Rue Villa L'Evenique. All the young girls were singing the Hermit of Saint-Aville, with words by Edmund Girard. The Yellow Dwarf was transferred into Murat. The Café Lemblin stood up for the Emperor against the Café Valois, which upheld the Bourbons. The Duc de Berry, already surveyed from the shadow by Louvel, had just been married to a princess of Sicily. Madame de Stael had died a year previously. The bodyguard hissed Mademoiselle Maz. The grand newspapers were all very small. Their form was restricted, but their liberty was great. The Constitutionnel was constitutional. La Minerva called Chateaubriand Chateaubriand. That made the good middle-class people laugh heartily at the expense of the great writer. In journals which sold themselves, prostituted journalists insulted the exiles of 1815. David had no longer any talent. Arnault had no longer any wit. Carnot was no longer honest. Sur had won no battles. It is true that Napoleon had no longer any genius. No one is ignorant of the fact that letters sent to an exile by post very rarely reached him, as the police made it their religious duty to intercept them. This is no new fact. Descartes complained of it in his exile. Now David, having, in a Belgian publication, shown some displeasure at not receiving letters which had been written to him, it struck the royalist journals as amusing and they derided the prescribed man well on this occasion. What separated two men more than abyss was to say the regicides, or to say the voters, to say the enemies, or to say the allies, to say Napoleon, or to say Bonaparte. All sensible people were agreed that the era of revolution had been closed forever by King Louis the Eighteenth. 
surnamed the immortal Arthur of the Chateau. On the platform of the Pont Neuf, the word Redevivieu was carved on the pedestal that awaited the statue of Henry the Fourth. M. Paillet, in the Rue de Teresa, number four, was making the rough draft of his privy assembly to consolidate the monarchy. The leaders of the right said at grave conjunctures, We must write to Bacot. M. M. Canuel O'Mahony and de Chapadelaine were preparing the sketch, to some extent with Monsieur's approval, of what was to become later on the conspiracy of the Bord de Lue of the waterside. Le Pingue Noir was already plotting in his own quarter. De la Verderie was conferring with Trogoff. M. de Quezes, who was liberal to a degree, reigned. Chateaubriand stood every morning at his window at number 27, Rue Saint-Dominique, clad in footed trousers and slippers, with a madras kerchief knotted over his grey hair, with his eyes fixed on a mirror, a complete set of dentist instruments spread out before him cleaning his teeth, which were charming, while he dictated the monarchy according to the Chateau to M. Pilorge, his secretary. Criticism, assuming an authoritative tone, preferred Lafon to Talma. M. de Filetez signed himself A. M. Hoffman signed himself Z. Charles Nodier wrote Therese Albert. Divorce was abolished. Lyceums called themselves colleges. The collegians, decorated on the collar with a golden fleur-de-lis, fought each other apropos of the King of Rome. The counter-police of the chateau had denounced to Her Royal Highness Madame the portrait, everywhere exhibited, of M. the Duc de Orleans, who made a better appearance in his uniform of a colonel-general of Hussars than M. the Duc de Berry in his uniform of colonel-general of Dragoons a serious inconvenience. The city of Paris was having the dome of the Invalids regilded at its own expense. Serious men asked themselves what M. D. Trinquelag would do on such an occasion. M. Clausel de Montaz differed on divers points from M. Clausel de Cosarogues. M. D. Salaberry was not satisfied. The comedian Picard, who belonged to the academy, which the comedian Moliere had not been able to do, had the two filiberts played at the Odeon, upon whose pediment the removal of the letter still allowed Theatre of the Empress to be plainly read. People took part for or against Cougenet de Montalot. Fabvier was factious, Bevaux was revolutionary. The liberal, Pellissier published an edition of Voltaire with following title, Works of Voltaire, the French Academy. That will attract purchasers, said the ingenious editor. The general opinion was that M. Charles Loison would be the genius of the century. Envy was beginning to gnaw at him, a sign of glory, and this verse was composed on him. Even when Loison steals, one feels that he has paws. As Cardinal Fesch refused to resign, M. de Pins, Archbishop of Amasi, administered the Diocese of Lyons. The quarrel over the valley of Dap was begun between Switzerland and France by a memoir from Captain, afterwards General Dufour. Saint Simon, ignored, was erecting his sublime dream. There was a celebrated Fourier at the Academy of Science, whom posterity has forgotten, and in some garret an obscure Fourier, whom the future will recall. Lord Byron was beginning to make his mark. A note to a poem by Millevoy introduced him to France in these terms, a certain Lord Baron. David de Angers was trying to work in marble. 
the Ab Karan was speaking, in terms of praise, to a private gathering of seminarists in the blind alley of Fuliantins of an unknown priest, named Felicite Robert, who at a later date became Lemini. A thing which smoked and clattered on the Seine with the noise of a swimming dog went and came beneath the windows of the Tuileries, from the Point Royale to the Pont Louis XV. It was a piece of mechanism which was not good for much, a sort of plaything, the idle dream of a dream-ridden inventor, and utopia, a steamboat. The Parisians stared indifferently at this useless thing. M. D. Vaublanc, the reformer of the Institute by a coup d'etat, the distinguished author of numerous academicians, ordinances, and batches of members, after having created them, could not succeed in becoming one himself. The Faubourg Saint-Germain and the Pavilion de Maussan wished to have M. Delevaux for Prefect of Police on account of his piety. De Poutrin and Ricamier entered into a quarrel in the amphitheatre of the School of Medicine, and threatened each other with their fists on the subject of the divinity of Jesus Christ. Cuvier, with one eye on Genesis and the other on nature, tried to please bigoted reaction by reconciling fossils with texts and by making mastodons flatter Moses. M. François de Neuchâteau, the praiseworthy cultivator of the memory of Parmentier, made a thousand efforts to have the pomme de terre potato pronounced Parmentier and succeeded therein not at all. The Ab Gregor, ex-bishop, ex-conventionary, ex-senator, had passed in the royal polemics to the state of infamous Gregor, the locution of which we have made use passed to the state of, has been condemned as a neologism by M. Royer Collard. Under the third arch of the Pont du Jena, the new stone with which the two years previously the mining aperture made by Blucher to blow up the bridge had been stopped up, was still recognizable on account of its whiteness. Justice summoned to its bar a man who, on seeing the Comte de Troyes enter Notre Dame, had said aloud, Sapristi! I regret the time when I saw Bonaparte and Talma enter the Belle Sauvage, arm in arm. A seditious utterance, six months in prison. Traitors showed themselves unbuttoned. Men who had gone over to the enemy on the eve of battle made no secret of their recompense, and strutted immodestly, in the light of day, in the cynicism of riches and dignities, deserters from Ligne and Quatre Bas, in their brazenness of their well-paid turpitude, exhibited their devotion to the monarchy in most barefaced manner. This is what floats up confusedly, pell-mell for the year 1817, and is now forgotten. History neglects nearly all these particulars, and cannot do otherwise. The infinity would overwhelm it. Nevertheless, these details, which are wrongly called trivial, there are no trivial facts in humanity, nor little leaves in vegetation, are useful. It is of the signamy of the years that the signamy of the centuries is composed. In this year of 1817, four young Parisians arranged a fine farce. End of Book 3, Chapter 1 of Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Recording by Betty Greeby in Wapella, Illinois. Book Three, Chapter Two of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Cho. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. 
Book Three in the Year 1817, Chapter Two, A Double Quartet. These Parisians came, one from Toulouse, another from Limoges, the third from Cahors, and the fourth from Montauban. But they were students, and when one says student, one says Parisian. To study in Paris is to be born in Paris. These young men were insignificant. Every one has seen such faces, four specimens of humanity taken at random, neither good nor bad, neither wise nor ignorant, neither geniuses nor fools, handsome with that charming April which is called twenty years. They were four Oscars, for at that epoch Arthur's did not yet exist. Burn for him the perfumes of Araby, exclaimed Romance. Oscar advances. Oscar, I shall behold him. People had just emerged from Ossian. Elegance was Scandinavian and Caledonian. The pure English style was only to prevail later, and the first of the Arthurs, Wellington, had but just won the Battle of Waterloo. These Oscars bore the names, one of Félix Tholomyès of Toulouse, the second Listolier of Cahors, the next Fameuil of Limoges, the last Blachevelle of Montauban. Naturally, each of them had his mistress. Blachevelle loved Favorite, so named because she had been in England. Listolier adored Dahlia, who had taken for her nickname the name of a flower. Fameuil idolized Zephine, an abridgment of Josephine. Tholomyès had Fantine, called the Blonde, because of her beautiful sunny hair. Favorite, Dahlia, Zephine, and Fantine were four ravishing young women, perfumed and radiant, still a little like working women, and not yet entirely divorced from their needles, somewhat disturbed by intrigues, but still retaining on their faces something of the serenity of toil, and in their souls that flower of honesty which survives the first fall in woman. One of the four was called the young, because she was the youngest of them and one was called the old. The old one was twenty-three. Not to conceal anything, the three first were more experienced, more heedless, and more emancipated into the tumult of life than Fantine the Blonde, who was still in her first illusions. Dahlia, Zephine, and especially Favorite could not have said as much. There had already been more than one episode in their romance, though hardly begun, and the lover who had borne the name of Adolf in the first chapter had turned out to be Alphonse in the second and Gustave in the third. Poverty and coquetry are two fatal counselors. One scolds and the other flatters, and the beautiful daughters of the people have both of them whispering in their ear, each on its own side. These badly guarded souls listen. Hence the falls which they accomplish, and the stones which are thrown at them. They are overwhelmed with splendor of all that is immaculate and inaccessible. Alas! What if the Jungfrau were hungry? Favorite, having been in England, was admired by Dahlia and Zephine. She had had an establishment of her own very early in life. Her father was an old unmarried professor of mathematics, a brutal man and a braggart, who went out to give lessons in spite of his age. This professor, when he was a young man, had one day seen a chambermaid's gown catch on a fender. He had fallen in love in consequence of this accident. The result had been favorite. She met her father from time to time, and he bowed to her. One morning, an old woman with the air of a devotee had entered her apartments and had said to her, You do not know me, mademoiselle. No. I am your mother. Then the old woman opened the sideboard and ate and drank, had a mattress which she owned brought in, and installed herself. This cross and pious old mother never spoke to Favorite, remained hours without uttering a word, breakfasted, dined, and supped for four, and went down to the porter's quarters for company, where she spoke ill of her daughter. It was having rosy nails that were too pretty which had drawn Dahlia to Listolier, to others, perhaps, to idleness. How could she make such nails work? She who wishes to remain virtuous must not have pity on her hands. As for Zephine, she had conquered Fameuil by her roguish and caressing little way of saying, Yes, sir. The young men were comrades, the young girls were friends, 
Such loves are always accompanied by such friendships. Goodness and philosophy are two distinct things. The proof of this is that, after making all due allowances for these little irregular households, Favorite, Zephine, and Dahlia were philosophical young women, while Fantine was a good girl. Good, someone will exclaim. And Ptolemyes? Solomon would reply that love forms a part of wisdom. We will confine ourselves to saying that the love of Fantine was a first love, a soul love, a faithful love. She alone, of all the four, was not called thou by a single one of them. Fantine was one of those beings who blossom, so to speak, from the dregs of the people. Though she had emerged from the most unfathomable depths of social shadow, she bore on her brow the sign of the anonymous and the unknown. She was born at Montreuil-sur-Mer, of what parents? Who can say? She had never known father or mother. She was called Fantine. Why Fantine? She had never borne any other name. At the epoch of her birth, the directory still existed. She had no family name. She had no family, no baptismal name. The church no longer existed. She bore the name which pleased the first random passer-by, who had encountered her, when a very small child, running bare-legged in the street. She received the name as she received the water from the clouds upon her brow when it rained. She was called Little Fantine. No one knew more than that. This human creature had entered life in just this way. At the age of ten, Fantine quitted the town and went to service with some farmers in the neighborhood. At fifteen, she came to Paris to seek her fortune. Fantine was beautiful and remained pure as long as she could. She was a lovely blonde with fine teeth. She had gold and pearls for her dowry, but her gold was on her head, and her pearls were in her mouth. She worked for her living, then still for the sake of her living. For the heart also has its hunger. She loved. She loved Ptolemyes. An amour for him, passion for her. The streets of the Latin Quarter, filled with throngs of students and grisettes, saw the beginning of their dream. Fantine had long evaded Ptolemyes in the mazes of the hill of the Pantheon, where so many adventurers twine and untwine, but in such a way as constantly to encounter him again. There is a way of avoiding which resembles seeking. In short, the eclogue took place. Blachevel, Listolier, and Fameuil formed a sort of group of which Ptolemyes was the head. It was he who possessed the wit. Ptolemyes was the antique old student. He was rich, he had an income of four thousand francs. Four thousand francs! A splendid scandal on Mount Saint Genevieve. Ptolemyes was a fast man of thirty, and badly preserved. He was wrinkled and toothless, and he had the beginning of a bald spot, of which he himself said with sadness, the skull at thirty, the knee at forty. His digestion was mediocre, and he had been attacked by a watering in one eye. But in proportion as his youth disappeared, gaiety was kindled. He replaced his teeth with buffooneries, his hair with mirth, his health with irony, his weeping eye laughed incessantly. He was dilapidated, but still in flower. His youth, which was packing up for departure long before its time, beat a retreat in good order, bursting with laughter, and no one saw anything but fire. He had had a piece rejected at the vaudeville. He made a few verses now and then. In addition to this, he doubted everything to the last degree, which is a vast force in the eyes of the weak. Being thus ironical and bald, he was the leader. Iron is an English word. Is it possible that irony is derived from it? One day Ptolemyes took the three others aside, with the gesture of an oracle, and said to them, Fantine, Dahlia, Zephine, and Favorite have been teasing us for nearly a year to give them a surprise. We have promised them solemnly that we would. They are forever talking about it to us, to me in particular, just as the old women in Naples cry to St. Januarius, Faccia Gialuta, fa o miracolo, yellow face, perform thy miracle. Sore beauty say to me incessantly, 
Ptolemyes, when will you bring forth your surprise? At the same time, our parents keep writing to us, pressure on both sides. The moment has arrived, it seems to me. Let us discuss the question. Thereupon, Ptolemyes lowered his voice and articulated something so mirthful that a vast and enthusiastic grin broke out upon the four mouths simultaneously, and Blachevelle exclaimed, That is an idea. A smoky taproom presented itself. They entered, and the remainder of their confidential colloquy was lost in shadow. The result of these shades was a dazzling pleasure party which took place on the following Sunday, the four young men inviting the four young girls. End of Book 3, Chapter 2Book 3, Chapter 3 of Les Miserables, translated by Elizabeth F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sean O'Hara. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book 3. In the year 1817. Chapter 3. 4 and 4. It is hard nowadays to picture to oneself what a pleasure trip of students and grisettes to the country was like forty-five years ago. The suburbs of Paris are no longer the same. The physiognomy of what may be called circumparisian life has changed completely in the last half century. Where there was the cuckoo, there is the railway car. Where there was a tender boat, there is now the steamboat. People speak of the comp nowadays as they spoke of St. Cloud in those days. The Paris of 1862 is a city which has France for its outskirts. The four couples conscientiously went through with all the country follies possible at that time. The vacation was beginning, and it was a warm, bright summer day. On the preceding day, Favorite, the only one who knew how to write, had written the following to Tholomyes in the name of the four. It is a good hour to emerge from happiness. That is why they arose at five o'clock in the morning. They went to St. Cloud by the coach, looked at the dry cascade, and exclaimed, This must be very beautiful when there is water. They breakfasted at Tête Noire, where Carstang had not yet been. They treated themselves to a game of ring-throwing under the kung-kung of trees of the Grand Fountain. They ascended Diogenes' lantern. They gambled for macaroons at the roulette establishment at Pont de Sevres, picked up bouquets at Pateau, brought reed-pipes at Muley, ate apple-tarts everywhere, and were perfectly happy. Young girls rustled and chatted like warblers escaped from their cage. It was a perfect delirium. From time to time they bestowed little taps on young men. Matutinal intoxication of life. Adorable years, the wings of the dragonfly quiver. Oh, whoever you may be, do you not remember? Have you rambled through the brushwood, holding aside the branches on account of the charming head which is coming on behind you? Have you slid laughing down a slope all wet with rain, with a beloved woman holding your hand and crying, Ah, my new boots! What a state they are in! Let us say at once that that merry obstacle, a shower, was lacking in the case of this good-humoured party, although Favorite had said, as they set out, magisterial and maternal tone, the slugs are crawling in the pass, a sign of rain, children. All four were madly pretty. A good old classic poet, then famous, a good fellow who had an Eleanor, Monsieur le Chevalier de la Brise, as he strolled that day beneath the chestnut trees of St. Cloud, saw them pass about ten o'clock in the morning and exclaimed, There's one too many of them, as he thought of the graces. Favorite, Blanchevelle's friend, one age three and twenty, the old one, ran on in front under the great green boughs, jumped the ditches, stalked distractedly over bushes, and presided over this merry-making with the spirit of a young female fawn. Zephine and Dahlia, whom chance had made beautiful in such a way that they set each other off when they were together, and completed each other, never left each other, more from an instinct of coquetry than from friendship, and clinging to each other, they assumed English poses. The first keepsakes had just made their appearance. Melancholy was dawning for women, as later on, Byronism dawned for men and the hair of the tender sex began to droop dolefully. Zephine and Dahlia had their hair dressed in rolls. Bustolier and Femille, who were engaged in discussing their professors, explained to Fantine the difference that existed between Monsieur Delvincourt and Monsieur Blondeau. Blachevelle seemed to have been created expressly to carry Favorite's single-bordered imitation India shawl of Ternau manufacture on his arms on Sunday. Tholomyes followed, dominating the group. He was very gay, but one felt the force of government in him. There was dictation in his joviality. 
His principal ornament was a pair of trousers of elephant leg pattern of nankeen, with straps of braided copper wire. He carried a stout rattan worth two hundred francs in his hand, and he treated himself to everything, a strange thing called a cigar in his mouth. Nothing was sacred to him. He smoked. That Thulamise is astounding, said the others with veneration. What trousers! What energy! As for Fantine, she was a joy to behold. Her splendid teeth had evidently received an office from God. Laughter. She preferred to carry her little hat of sewed straw, with its long white strings, in her hand rather than on her head. Her thick blonde hair, which was inclined to wave, and which easily uncoiled, and which it was necessary to fasten up incessantly, seemed made for the flight of the Galatea under the willows. Her rosy lips babbled enchantingly. The corners of her mouth voluptuously turned up, as in the antique masks of Origany, had an air of encouraging the audacious. But her long, shadowy lashes drooped discreetly over the jollity of the lower part of her face, as though to call a halt. There was something indescribably harmonious and striking about her entire dress. She wore a gown of mauve barege, little reddish-brown buskins, whose ribbons traced necks on her fine, white, open-worked stockings, and that sort of muslin spencer, a Marseille invention, whose name, Kenazo, a corruption of the words Kins Ahout, pronounced after the fashion of Canbier, signifies fine weather, heat, and midday. The three others, less timid as we have already said, wore low-necked dresses without disguise, which in summer, beneath flower-adorned hats, are very graceful and enticing. But by the side of these audacious outfits, blonde Fantine's Canazo, with its transparencies, its indiscretions, its reticence, concealing and displaying at one and the same time, seemed an alluring godsend of decency, and the famous court of love, presided by the Vicomtesse de Sette, with the sea-green eyes, would, perhaps, have awarded the prize for coquetry to this canazo, in the contest for the prize of modesty. The most ingenious is, at times, the wisest. This does happen. Brilliant of face, delicate of profile, with eyes of a deep blue, heavy lids, feet arched and small, wrists and ankles admirably formed, a white skin, which here and there allowed the azure branching of the veins to be seen, joy, a cheek that was young and fresh, the robust throat of the Juno Vagina, a strong and supple nape of the neck, shoulders modeled as though by Gusteau, with a voluptuous dimple in the middle, visible through the muslin, a gaiety cooled by dreaminess, sculptural and exquisite, such was Fantine and beneath these feminine adornments and these ribbons one could divine a statue, and in that statue a soul. Fantine was beautiful without being conscious of it. Those rare dreamers, mysterious priests of the beautiful, who silently confront everything with perfection, would have caught a glimpse in this little working woman, through the transparency of her Parisian grace, of the ancient sacred euphony. This daughter of the shadows was thoroughbred. She was beautiful in the two ways, style and rhythm. Style is the form of the ideal. Rhythm is its movement. We have said that Fantine was joy. She was also modesty. To an observer who studied her attentively, that which breathed from her athwart all the intoxication of her age, the season, and her love affair, was an invincible expression of reserve and modesty. She remained a little astonished. This chaste astonishment is the shade of difference that separates Psyche from Venus. Fantine had the long, white fingers of the Vestal Virgin, who stirs the ashes of the sacred fire with a golden pin. Although she would have refused nothing to Tholomyes, as we shall have more than ample opportunity to see, her face and her pose were supremely virginal. A sort of serious and almost austere dignity suddenly overwhelmed her at certain times, and there is nothing more singular and disturbing than to see gaiety become so suddenly extinct there, and meditation succeed to cheerfulness without any transition state. This sudden and sometimes severely accentuated gravity resembled the disdain of a goddess. Her brow, her nose, her chin presented that equilibrium of outline which is quite distinct from equilibrium of proportion and from which harmony of countenance results. In the very characteristic interval which separates the base of the nose from the upper lip, she had that imperceptible and charming fold, a mysterious sign of chastity which makes Barbarossa fall in love with that Diana found in the treasures of Iconia. Love is a fault, so be it. Fantine was innocence floating high over fault. End of Book Three, Chapter Three. Book Three, Chapter Four of Les Miserables, translated by Isabella F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo Book Three, In the Year 1817 Chapter Four Tholomyes is so merry that he sings a Spanish ditty. That day was composed of dawn, from one end to the other. All nature seemed to be having a holiday, and to be laughing. The flower-beds of St. Cloud perfumed the air, the breath of the Seine rustled the leaves vaguely, the branches gesticulated in the wind, bees pillaged the jasmines, a whole bohemia of butterflies swooped down upon the arrow, the clover, and the sterile oats, a whole bohemia of butterflies swooped down upon the yarrow, the clover, and the sterile oats. In the august park of the King of France there was a pack of vagabonds, the birds. The four merry couples, mingled with the sun, the fields, the flowers, the trees, were resplendent. And in this community of paradise, talking, singing, running, dancing, chasing butterflies, plucking convolvus, wetting their pink, open-work stockings in the tall grass, fresh, wild, without malice, all received to some extent the kisses of all, with the exception of Fantine, who was hedged about with that vague resistance of hers, composed of dreaminess and wildness, and who was in love. "'You always have a queer look about you,' said Favourite to her. "'Such things are joys. These passages of happy couples are a profound appeal to life and nature, and make a caress and light spring forth from everything.' There was once a fairy who created the fields and forests expressly for those in love, in that eternal hedge-school of lovers, which is forever beginning anew, and which will last as long as there are hedges and scholars. Hence the popularity of spring among thinkers. The patrician and the knife-grinder, the duke and the peer, the limb of the law, the courtiers and townspeople, as they used to say in olden times, are all subjects of this fairy. They laugh and hunt, and there is in the air the brilliance of an apotheosis. What a transfiguration affected by love! Notaries' clerks are gods. And the little cries, the pursuits through the grass, the waists embrace on the fly, those jargons which are melodies, those adorations which burst forth in the manner of pronouncing a syllable, those cherries torn from one mouth by another, all this blazes forth and takes its place among the celestial glories." Beautiful women waste themselves sweetly. They think that this will never come to an end. Philosophers, poets, painters, observe these ecstasies, and know not what to make of it. So greatly are they dazzled by it. The departure for Cythera, exclaims Watteau, Lancret, the painter of plebeians, contemplates his bourgeois, who have flitted away into the azure sky. Diderot stretches out his arms to all those love idols, and Durfe mingles druids with them. After breakfast the four couples went to what was then called the King's Square to see a newly arrived plant from India, whose name escapes our memory at this moment, and which at that epoch was attracting all Paris to St. Cloud. It was an odd and charming shrub with a long stem, whose numerous branches, bristling and leafless, and as fine as threads, were covered with a million tiny white rosettes. This gave the shrub the air of a head of hair studded with flowers. There was always an admiring crowd about it. After viewing the thub, Ptolemies exclaimed, I offer you asses, and having agreed upon a price with the owner of the asses, they returned by way of Van Vries and Issy. At Issy an incident occurred. The truly national park, at that time owned by Burgun, the contractor, happened to be wide open. They passed the gates, visited the mannequin Anchorite in his grotto, tried the mysterious little effects of the famous cabinet of mirrors, the wanton trap worthy of a satyr become a millionaire, or of Tuscare metamorphosed into a Priapus. They had stoutly shaken the swing attached to the two chestnut trees celebrated by the Abbey de Bernice. As he swung these beauties, one after the other, produced folds in the fluttering skirts, which Gruz would have found to his taste, amid peals of laughter, the Toulousan Ptolemies, who was somewhat of a Spaniard, Toulouse being the cousin of Tolosa, spang to a melancholy chant the old ballad Galaga, probably inspired by some lovely maid dashing in full flight upon a rope between two trees. Soya de Badios, Amor mi ama, Toda mi alma, Es en mi ojos, Porque ensenas a tuas piernas. 
Barrios is my home, and love is my name, to all my eyes in flame, all my soul doth come, for instruction meet, I receive at thy feet. Fantine alone refused to swing. I don't like to have people put on airs like that, muttered Favourite, with a good deal of acrimony. After leaving the asses there was a fresh delight. They crossed the Seine in a boat, and proceeding from Passy on foot they reached the barrier of L'Etoile. They had been up since five o'clock that morning, as the reader will remember. But, bah, there is no such thing as fatigue on Sunday, said Favourite. On Sunday fatigue does not work. About three o'clock the four couples, frightened at their happiness, were sliding down the Russian mountains, a singular edifice which then occupied the heights of Beaujon, and whose undulating line was visible above the trees of the Champs-Élysées. From time to time Favourite exclaimed, "'And the surprise? I claim the surprise.' "'Patience,' replied Ptolemies. End of Book Three, Chapter Four Book Three, Chapter Five of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Williams. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Three, in the year 1817. Chapter Five, at Bombardas. The Russian mountains having been exhausted, they began to think about dinner, and the radiant party of eight, somewhat weary at last, became stranded in Bombardas public house, a branch establishment which had been set up in the Champs Elysees by that famous restaurant keeper Bombarda, whose sign could then be seen in the Rue de Rivoli near Delorme Alley, a large but ugly room with an alcove and a bed at the end, they had been obliged to put up with this accommodation in view of the Sunday crowd, two windows whence they could survey beyond the elms, the quay, and the river, a magnificent August sunlight lightly touching the panes, two tables, upon one of them a triumphant mountain of bouquets, mingled with the hats of men and women, at the other end four couples seated round a merry confusion of platters, dishes, glasses, and bottles. Jugs of beer mingled with flasks of wine, very little order on the table, some disorder beneath it. They made beneath the table a noise, a clatter of the feet that was abominable, says Moliere. This was the state which the shepherd idol, begun at five o'clock in the morning, had reached at half-past four in the afternoon. The sun was setting, their appetites were satisfied. The Champs-Élysées, filled with sunshine and with people, were nothing but light and dust, the two things of which glory is composed. The horses of Marly, those neighing marbles, were prancing in a cloud of gold. Carriages were going and coming. A squadron of magnificent bodyguards, with their clarions at their head, were descending the avenue de Nuilly. The white flag, showing faintly rosy in the setting sun, floated over the dome of the Tuileries. The Place de la Concorde, which had become the Place Louis XV once more, was choked with happy promenaders. Many wore the silver fleur-de-lis suspended from the white-watered ribbon, which had not yet wholly disappeared from the buttonholes in the year 1817. Here and there choruses of little girls threw to the winds, amid the passers-by, who formed into circles and applauded. The then celebrated Bourbon air, which was destined to strike the hundred days with lightning, and which had for its refrain, Rendez-nous notre père de Gand, rendez-nous notre père. Give us back our father from Ghent, give us back our father. Groups of dwellers in the suburbs, in Sunday array, sometimes even decorated with the fleur-de-lis, like the bourgeois, scattered over the large square and the Marigny square, were playing at rings and revolving on the wooden horses. Others were engaged in drinking. Some journeymen printers had on paper cups. Their laughter was audible. Everything was radiant. It was a time of undisputed peace and profound royalist security. It was the epoch when a special and private report of Chief of Police Angelet to the King on the subject of the suburbs of Paris terminated with these lines. Taking all things into consideration, sire, there is nothing to be feared from these people. They are as heedless and as indolent as cats. 
The population is restless in the provinces. It is not in Paris. These are very pretty men, sire. It would take all of two of them to make one of your grenadiers. There is nothing to be feared on the part of the populace of Paris, the capital. It is remarkable that the stature of this population should have diminished in the last fifty years, and the populace of the suburbs is still more puny than at the time of the revolution. It is not dangerous. In short, it is an amiable rabble. Prefects of the police do not deem it possible that a cat can transform itself into a lion. That does happen, however, and in that lies the miracle wrought by the populace of Paris. Moreover, the cat, so despised by Count Angelet, possessed the esteem of the republics of old. In their eyes it was liberty incarnate, and as though to serve as pendant to Minerva Aptera of the Piraeus, there stood on the public square in Corinth the colossal bronze figure of a cat. The ingenious police of the Restoration held the populace of Paris in two rose-colored alight. It is not so much of an amiable rabble as it is thought. The Parisian is to the Frenchman what the Athenian was to the Greek. No one sleeps more soundly than he. No one is more frankly frivolous and lazy than he. No one can better assume the air of forgetfulness. Let him not be trusted, nevertheless. He is ready for any sort of cool deed, but when there is glory at the end of it he is worthy of admiration in every sort of fury. Give him a pike, he will produce the tenth of August. Give him a gun, you will have Austerlitz. He is Napoleon's stay and Danton's resource. Is it a question of country? He enlists. Is it a question of liberty? He tears up the pavements. Beware. His hair filled with wrath is epic. His blouse drapes itself like the folds of a clamis. Take care. He will make of the first rue grenatat which comes to hand Caudine Forks. When the hour strikes, this man of the faubourgs will grow in stature. This little man will arise, and his gaze will be terrible, and his breath will become a tempest, and there will issue forth from that slender chest enough wind to disarrange the folds of the Alps. It is thanks to the suburban man of Paris that the revolution, mixed with arms, conquers Europe. He sings. It is his delight. Proportion his song to his nature, and you will see. As long as he has for his refrain nothing but Le Carmagnol, he only overthrows Louis the Sixteenth. Make him sing the Marseillaise, and he will free the world. This note, jotted down on the margin of Angelet's report, will return to our four couples. The dinner, as we have said, was drawing to its close. End of Book Three, Chapter Five Recording by Sarah Williams, Germantown, Maryland. Book Three, Chapter Six of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book Three, Chapter Six, a chapter in which they adore each other. Chat at table, the chat of love. It is as impossible to reproduce one as the other. The chat of love is a cloud. The chat at table is smoke. Fameuil and Dahlia were humming. Tholomyes was drinking. Zephine was laughing. Fantine smiling. Listolier blowing a wooden trumpet which he had purchased at Saint Cloud. Favourite gazed tenderly at Blachevelle and said, Blachevelle, I adore you. This calls forth a question from Blachevelle. What would you do, Favourite, if I were to cease to love you? I, cried Favourite, oh, do not say that even in jest. If you were to cease to love me, I would spring after you. I would scratch you. I should rend you. I would throw you into the water. I would have you arrested. Blachevelle smiled with the voluptuous self-conceit of a man who is tickled in his self-love. Favourite resumed. Yes, I would scream to the police. Ah, I should not restrain myself, not at all. Rabble. Blachevelle threw himself back in his chair in an ecstasy, and closed both eyes proudly. 
Dahlia, as she ate, said in a low voice to Favourite, amid the uproar, "'So you really idolise him deeply, that Blachevelle of yours?' "'I? I detest him,' replied Favourite in the same tone, seizing her fork again. "'He is avaricious. I love the little fellow opposite me in my house. He is very nice, that young man. Do you know him?' "'One can see that he is an actor by profession. "'I love actors. "'As soon as he comes in, his mother says to him, "'Ah, mon Dieu, my peace of mind is gone. "'There he goes with his shouting. "'But, my dear, you are splitting my head. "'So he goes up to rat-written garrets, "'to black holes as high as he can mount. "'And there he sets to singing, declaiming, "'How do I know what? "'So that he can be heard downstairs. "'He earns twenty sous a day at the attorney's "'by penning quibbles.' He is the son of a former presenter of St. Jacques de Haupas, and he is very nice. He idolises me so, that one day, when he saw me making batter for some pancakes, he said to me, Mademoiselle, make your gloves into fritters, and I will eat them. It is only artists who can say such things as that. <sighs> he is very nice. I am in a fair way to go out of my head over that little fellow. Never mind, I tell Blachevelle that I adore him. How I lie, hey? How I do lie. Favourite paused and then went on. I am sad, you see, Dahlia. It has done nothing but rain all summer. The wind irritates me. The wind does not abate. Plachevel is very stingy. There are hardly any green peas in the market. One does not know what to eat. I have the spleen, as the English say. Butter is so dear. "'And then you see it is horrible. "'Here we are dining in a room with a bed in it, "'and that disgusts me with life.'" End of Book 3, Chapter 6「もう一つのことを言うと、私たちは、リブロックスを見つけた。」「Les Miserables」by Victor Hugo。Book 3, Chapter 7。The Wisdom of Tholomyes。In the meantime, while some sang, the rest talked together, tumultuously, all at once. It was no longer anything but noise. Tholomyes intervened. Let us not talk at random, nor too fast, he exclaimed. Let us reflect if we wish to be brilliant. Too much improvisation empties the mind in a stupid way. Running beer gathers no froth. No haste, gentlemen. Let us mingle majesty with the feast. Let us eat with meditation. Let us make haste slowly. Let us not hurry. Consider the springtime. If it makes haste, it is done for. That is to say, it gets frozen. Excess of zeal ruins peach trees and apricot trees. Excess of zeal kills the grace and the mirth of good dinners. No zeal, gentlemen. Grimard de la Reine agrees with Talleyrand. A hollow sound of rebellion rumbled through the group. Leave us in peace, Tholomyes, said Blachevelle. Down with the tyrant, said Fame. Bombardo, bombance, and bombachelle, we cried this Tollier. Sunday exists, resumed Fermat. We are sober, added Listolier. Tholomyes, remarked Blanchevelle, contemplate my calmness, mon calm. You are the marquis of that, retorted Tholomyes. This mediocre play upon words produced the effect of a stone in a pool. The marquis de Montcalm was at that time a celebrated royalist. All the frogs held their peace. Friends, cried Tholomyes, with the accent of a man who had recovered his empire, come to yourself. This pun which has fallen from the skies must not be received with too much stupor. Everything which falls in that way is not necessarily worthy of enthusiasm and respect. The pun is the dung of the mind which soars. The jest falls no matter where, and the mind, after producing a piece of stupidity, plunges into the azure depths. A whitish speck flattened against the rock does not prevent the condor from soaring aloft. Far be it from me to insult the pun. I honour it in proportion to its merits, nothing more. All the most august, the most sublime, the most charming of humanity, and perhaps outside of humanity, have made puns. Jesus Christ made a pun on St. Peter. 
Moses on Isaac, Ascaris on Polynices, Cleopatra on Octavius, and observe that Cleopatra's pun preceded the Battle of Actium, and had it not been for it, no one would have remembered the Greek city of Turin, a Greek name which signifies a ladle. That once conceded, I return to my exhortation. I repeat, brothers, I repeat, no zeal, no hubbub, no excess, even in witticisms, gaiety, jollities, or plays on words. Listen to me. I have the prudence of Amphirus and the baldness of Caesar. There must be a limit even to rebuses, et murders en rebus. There must be a limit even to dinners. You are fond of apple turnovers, lady. Do not indulge in them to excess. Even in the matter of turnovers, good sense and art are requisite. Gluttony chastises the glutton. Gula punit gulax. Indigestion is charged by the good God with preaching morality to stomachs. And remember this. Each one of our passions, even love, has a stomach which must not be filled too full. In all things the word finis must be written in good season. Self-control must be exercised when the matter becomes urgent. The bolt must be drawn on appetite. One must set one's own fantasy to the violin, and carries one's own self to the post. The sage is the man who knows how, at a given moment, to effect his own arrest. Have some confidence in me, for I have succeeded to some extent in my study of the law, according to the verdict of my examinations for I know the difference between the question put and the question pending. For I have sustained a thesis in Latin upon the manner in which torture was administered at Rome at the epoch when Manetus Demons was quester of the parasite. Because I am going to be a doctor, apparently, it does not follow that it is absolutely necessary that I shall be an imbecile. I recommend you to moderation in your desires. It is true that my name is Felix Tholomyes. I speak well. Happy is he who, when the hour strikes, takes a heroic resolve and abdicates like Scylla or Orogenes. Favourite listened with profound attention. Felix, she said, what a pretty word. I love that name. It is Latin. It means prosper. Tholomyes went on. Curitis, gentlemen, cavalierus, my friends, do you wish never to feel the prick, to do without the nuptial bed, and to brave love? Nothing more simple. Here is a receipt. Lemonade, excess exercise, hard labour, work yourself to death, drag blocks, sleep not, hold vigil, gorge yourself with nitrous beverages and portions of nymphias, drink emulsion of poppies and agnus castus, season this with a strict diet, starve yourself, and add thereto cold baths, girdles of herbs, the application of a plate of lead, Notions made with a subacetate of lead and fermentations of oxycrate. I prefer a woman, said Lestolier. Woman, resumed Tholomyes, distrust her, woes to him who yields himself to the unstable heart of woman. Woman is perfidious and disingenuous. She detests the serpent from the professional jealousy. The serpent is the shop over the way. Tholomyes, cried Blachevelle, you are drunk. Pardon, says Tholomyes. Then be gay, resumed Blachevelle. I agree to that, responded Tholomyes, and, refilling his glass, he rose. Glory to wine, nunc tabacca, canum. Pardon me, ladies, that is Spanish, and the proof of it, signoras, is this. Like people, like cask. The Aroba of Castile contains sixteen litres, the Cantara of Alicante twelve, the Alamud of the Canaries twenty-five, the Curtain of the Balearic Isles, twenty-six, the boot of Tsar Peter, thirty. Long live that Tsar, who was great, and long live his boot, which was still greater. Ladies, take the advice of a friend. Make a mistake in your neighbour if you see fit. The property of love is to err. A love affair is not made to crouch down and brutalise itself like an English serving-maid who has calluses on her knees from scrubbing. It is not made for that. It is gaily our gentle love. It has been said, error is human. I say, error is love. Ladies, I idolize you all. O Zephine, O Josephine, face more than irregular. 
You would be charming were you not all askew. You have the air of a pretty face upon which someone has sat down by mistake. As for favourite, oh, nymphs and muses! One day when Blachevelle was crossing the gutter in the Rue Gurin Boisseau, he espied a beautiful girl with white stockings well drawn up, which displayed her legs. This prologue pleased him, and Blachevelle fell in love. The one he loved was Favourite. Ah, oh, Favourite, thou hast Ionian lips. There was a Greek painter named Euphorion, who was surnamed the painter of the lips. That Greek alone would have been worthy to paint thy mouth. Listen, before thee, there was never a creature worthy of the name. Thou were made to receive the apple like Venus, or to eat it like Eve. Beauty begins with thee. I have just referred to Eve's. It is thou who hast created her. Thou deservest the lettuce patent of the beautiful women. O oh, favourite, I cease to address you as thou, because I pass from poetry to prose. You were speaking of my name a little while ago. That touched me. But let us, whoever we may be, distrust names. They may delude us. I am called Felix, and I am not happy. Words are liars. Let us not blindly accept the indications which they afford us. It would be a mistake to write to liege for corks, and to power for gloves. Miss Dahlia, were I in your place, I would call myself Rosa. A flower should spell sweet, and women should have wit. I say nothing of Fantine. She is a dreamer, a musing, thoughtful, pensive person. She is a phantom possessed of the form of a nymph and the modesty of a nun, who has strayed into the life of a grisette, but who takes refuge in illusions, and who sings and prays and gazes into the azure without very well knowing what she sees or what she is doing, and who, with her ears fixed on heaven, wanders in a garden where there are more birds than are in existence. O oh, Fantine, know this. I, Tholomyes, I am all illusion, but she does not even hear me. That blonde maid of Camerus, as for the rest... Everything about her is freshness, suavity, youth, sweet morning light. O oh, Fantine, made worthy of being called Marguerite or Pearl, you are a woman from the beauteous Orient. Ladies, a second piece of advice. Do not marry. Marriage is a graft. It takes well or ill. Avoid that risk. But, bah, what am I saying? I am wasting my words. Girls are incurable on the subject of marriage and all that we wise men can say will not prevent the waistcoat-makers and the shoe-stitchers from dreaming of husbands studded with diamonds. Well, so be it. But, my beauties, remember this. You eat too much sugar. You have but one fault, O oh woman, and that is nibbling sugar. O oh, nibbling sex, your pretty little white teeth adore sugar. Now hear me well. Sugar is a salt. All salts are withering. Sugar is the most desiccating of all salts. It sucks the liquids of the blood through the veins. Hence the coagulation, and then the solidification of the blood. Hence tubercles in the lungs, hence death. That is why diabetes borders on consumption. Then do not crunch sugar, and you will live. I turn to the men. Gentlemen, make conquest. Rob each other of your well-beloved without remorse. Chasse across. In love there are no friends. Everywhere there is a pretty woman, hostility is open. No quarter, war to the death. A pretty woman is a causeless ballet. A pretty woman is flagrant misdemeanour. All the invasions of history have been determined by petticoats. Woman is man's right. Romulus carried off the Sabines. William carried off the Saxon women. Caesar carried off the Roman women. The man who has not loved soars like a vulture over the mistresses of other men. And for my own part, to all those unfortunate men who are widowers, I throw the sublime proclamation of Bonaparte to the army of Italy. Soldiers, you are in need of everything. The enemy has it. Tholomy paused. Take breath, Tholomy, said Blachevelle. At the same moment, Blachevelle supported by Lestolia and Fermé, struck up a plaintive air, one of those stupid studio songs composed of the first words which come to hand, rhymed richly and not at all. 
as destitute of sense as the gesture of the tree, and the sounds of the wind, which have their birth in the vapour of pipes, and are dissipated and take their flight with them. This is the couplet by which the group replied the Tholomé's harangue. The father turkey cock so grave some money to an agent gave. That master, good Clement Tonnier, might be made Pope on St. John's Day Fair. But this good Clement could not be made Pope, because no priest was he. And then their agent, whose wrath burned, with all their money back returned. This was not calculated to calm Tholomy's improvisation. He emptied his glass, filled, refilled it, and began again. Down with wisdom, forget that all I have said. Let us be neither prudes, nor prudent men, nor prudhommes. I propose a toast to mirth. Be merry, let us complete our course of law by folly and eating, indigestion and the digest. Let Justinian be the male, and feasting the female. Joy in the depth. Live, O creation. The world is a great diamond. I am happy. The birds are astonishing. What a festival everywhere. The nightingale is a gratuitous elevure. Summer, I salute thee. O Luxembourg, O Georgic of the Rue Madame, and of the Allée de l'Observatoire. O pensive infantry soldiers, or all those charming nurses who, while they guard the children, amuse themselves. The pampas of America would please me if I had not the arcades of the Odeon. My soul flits away into the virgin forests and to the savannas. All is beautiful. The flies buzz in the sun. The sun has sneezed out the hummingbird. Embrace me, Fantine. He made a mistake and embraced Favourite. End of Book 3, Chapter 7《Book t h Chapter Eight of l e m i s é r a b l e translated by Isabel F. h a p g o o d This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Vera n v i e l l e m i s é r a b l e by Victor Hugo. Book t h The House in the Rue Plumet. Chapter Eight: The Death of a Horse. The dinners are better at Eden than at Bombardus, exclaimed the fiend. I prefer Bombarda to Eden, declared Blashville. There is more luxury, it is more Asiatic. Look at the room downstairs. There are mirrors, glazes, on the walls. I prefer them, glazes, ices, on my plate, said favourite. Blashville persisted. Look at the knives. The handles are of silver at Bombardus and of bone at Eden. Now, silver is more valuable than bone. Except for those who have a silver chin, observed Tolomy. He was looking at the dome of the Invalide, which was visible from Bombardus' windows. A pause ensued. Tolomy, exclaimed Fameux. The Toulier and I were having a discussion just now. A discussion is a good thing, replied Tolomy. A quarrel is better. We are disputing about philosophy. Well, but you prefer Descartes or Spinoza? To Tolomy. Said Tolomy. This decree pronounced, he took a drink and went on. I consent to live. All is not at an end on earth, since we can still talk nonsense, for there I return thanks to immortal gods. We lie. One lies, but one laughs. One affirms, but one doubts. The unexpected burst forth from the syllogism. That is fine. There are still human beings here below who know how to open and close the surprise box of a paradox merrily. This, ladies, that you are drinking with so tranquil an air, is Madeira wine, you must know, from the vineyard of Coral de Schreirsch, which is three hundred and seventeen fathoms above the level of the sea. Attention while you drink. Three hundred and seventeen fathoms. And Monsieur Bombarda, the magnificent eating housekeeper, gives you those three hundred and seventeen fathoms for four francs and fifty centimes. Again, Famuy interrupted him. Your opinions fix the law. Who is your favourite author? Pierre? Gant? No, Chou. And Tolomy continued. Honour to Bombarda. He would equal Moniface of Elephanta if he could but get me an Indian dancing girl, and to Gillion of Chironia if he could bring me a Greek courtesan. For, old oh, ladies, there were Bombardas in Greece and in Egypt. 
Apollyus tells of them. Alas, always the same, nothing more unpublished by the Creator and creation. No subsole nuvo, says Solomon. Amor omnibus idem, says Virgil, and Carabine mounts with Carabin into a bar of saint Clou, as Aspasia embarked with Paracles upon the fleet at Samos. One last word. Do you know what Aspasia was, ladies? Although she lived at an epoch where women had, as yet, no soul, she was a soul, a soul of rosy and purple hue, more ardent hue than fire, fresher than the dawn. Aspasia was a creature in whom two extremes of womanhood met. She was a goddess prostitute. Socrates plus men in school. Aspasia was created in case a mistress should be needed for Prometheus. Tulumi, once started, would have found some difficulty in stopping, had not a horse fallen down upon the quay just at that moment. The shock caused the cart and the orator to come to a dead halt. It was a beau mare, old and thin, and one fit for the knacker, which was dragging a very heavy cart. On arriving in front of Mbardas, the worn-out, exhausted beast had refused to proceed any further. This incident attracted a crowd. Hardly had the cursing and indignant carter had time to utter with proper energy the sacramental word, Matin the jade, backed up, with a pitiless cut of a whip, when the jade fell, never to rise again. On hearing the hubbub made by the passers-by, Tulumi's merry auditors turned their heads, and Tulumi took advantage of the opportunity to bring his elocution to a close with his melancholy strophe. Et les dits de ce monde Ocuscus et Carus, on le même distant, et, Rus, il a vécu ce que vivant les Rus, l'espace dans ma temps. Poire, sighed Fantine, and Dahlia exclaimed, There's Fantine on the point of crying over horses. How can one be such a pitiful fool as that? At that moment, favourite, holding her arms and throwing her head back, looked resolutely at Tolomy and said, Come, now, the surprise. Exactly. The moment has arrived, replied Tolomy. Gentlemen, the hour for giving these ladies a surprise has struck. Wait for us a moment, ladies. It begins with a kiss, said Blacheville. On the brow, added Tolomy, each gravely bestowed a kiss on his mistress's brow. Then all four fell out through the door, with their fingers on their lips. Favourite clapped her hands on their departure. It's beginning to be amusing already, said she. Don't be too long, murmured Fantine. We are waiting for you. End of book third, chapter eight.